Hello and welcome to today's live stream. If you could do me a favor, let me know where you're joining from. While we are waiting, let me know that you can hear me, that you're having a great day. Let me know where you are joining us from. Looks like we have some familiar faces and some others that we wish weren't here like Christopher Gilbert. No, I'm just kidding. Looks like we have a lot of our friends here. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be right with you. About a minute left. Let me know where you're joining us from.
that whole thing. I didn't even have I, my normal muting. So, and you you didn't even know I was talking because I was wearing a mask. So I just wanted to do a quick call out on the masks, staying on point, staying on brand, if you will. Um, these are from, my sister made these for us. All of our employees got these uh, so we can stay on brand. Uh, she has a little store down in Ashland, Ohio uh, called Whoopsie Daisy Boutique, and she's been churning these out for people. So um, when you come and see us at the store, hopefully on the 12th, you'll be able to see us in these awesome masks. So those are pretty awesome. So today we are going to talk about, um, what are we gonna talk about, Kevin? We are going to be talking about cinematography. And I just did that to wake him up. He was kind of leaning back in his chair and he's like, wait, I'm on? I don't even know. Today we're gonna be talking about cinematography. So let's go ahead and bring in our guest here, Mr. Kevin Best. How are we doing, sir? I'm doing good. I'm hanging in there during these quarantine times and uh, I'm ready to talk about cinematography. Excellent. I'm excited. So give us a little bit of background. What what qualifies you to be someone that can talk about cinematography? Who are you? Sure. So I'm Kevin Best. Um, I went to Bowling Green State University to get a film degree. Um, I wanted to, you know, specify uh, my career going into cinematography. A lot of people want to be director, writer, getting the sound. Uh, I specifically wanted to work with the camera and create the visuals for projects. So um, cinematography and coloring, those were my my two go-tos. Um, and I kind of took those after college. And um, basically when you're in college, you have a huge crew to work with. And then when you're done, you kind of lose everybody. So uh, I took the first year after college to kind of get into photography because uh, you don't really need a crew to go out and just shoot with a camera uh, yeah. just to keep the creative juices flowing. Um, and then I began working on little projects here and there. Um, one of my friends, Nick Weiss, who graduated a few years uh, before me, um, started bringing me on to projects, and I was able to kind of, you know, get used to working in professional uh, settings and uh, working with the camera and professional setups. So uh, from there, I took that knowledge, um, and I worked with another friend from Bowling Green who lived in LA, uh, and then he moved back to Ohio. So we kind of merged our talents and our Rolodex of clients together and created our own production company uh, called Early Bird. Um, so now we've been uh, starting our, our own company and working together. It's been going on for about a year now. Um, things have hit a halt right now for productions, but uh, we're currently editing a few projects, um, coloring a few products. Um, so, you know, just keeping busy during these times. I love it. And I noticed a little banner over your shoulder there. Yes, so I, I also work for Panasonic. Um, uh, I, they grabbed me to, you know, they, they're very video oriented, so I kind of landed in a perfect company uh, to kind of work with their cameras and kind of showcase all the amazing video features that Panasonic uh, really has, so. Awesome, I love it. So um, before we get started, I do have a couple housekeeping things that I wanted to go over and then it'll be all yours. So if you wanted to start getting the uh, the screen share ready, uh, that. that would be excellent. So a couple things, we are at the store from 10 to seven Monday through Friday and 10 to five on Saturday. We're offering curbside pickup at this time. Uh, so we'll just bring it out to your car, um, whatever you need. We've had a lot of people take advantage of that. And then if you want it shipped, just go onto our website, thepixelconnection.com. Um, you'll be able to check out and, you know, we can ship that right to your door. There's free shipping on a ton of items. Also, if there's something that you want us to cover in these live streams, please let us know if there's something that you want a little bit more of. You know, we had a great, um, we had great, great feedback from Chris's talk yesterday. Um, so we actually rescheduled another one in a couple weeks um, to have him come back and talk about composition. So, you know, this is all driven by you guys, you know, whatever you need, whatever you want. That's what our goal is to provide that content for you. A quick note about the PPA, the Professional Photographers of America. They are offering all of their courses and all of their, um, they're doing webinars, they're doing a ton during this time. Uh, so I wanna let you guys know about it. If you head over to their website, ppa.com slash in it together, then you'll be able to get to that content. It's normally behind a 30 to $40 paywall. So it's a really awesome opportunity to learn something new. Also, if you could, if you head over to social.thepixelconnection.com, we did launch a podcast all about the business of photography. So we actually just came out with episode six last Friday. Um, so the, this is all about business. It's not about sales. It's not about gear. It's all about the business of photography. Um, so I would urge you to go and take a look at that, especially if you are in the business of photography. 
So what are our goals for today? Obviously, we're going to learn a little bit about, you know, cinematography, but the overarching goal is to pull you away from the fear, uncertainty, and doubt that is going on around us and remind you that you have this camera. Maybe it's been sitting there collecting a little bit of dust. My goal is to, you know, get you to grab it and shoot a little bit of video, try something new. At the end of the day, that's where the growth happens. My goal is to get you outside of your comfort zone. If you've never done video before, this is the perfect time to try it. You know, you're, and I'm bringing in these guests that know a lot about these different topics, but another reason that I bring these guests by is because, you know, they are familiar faces. So Kevin is local to the store and he puts on, you know, different classes at the store along with um, Panasonic. So, you know, if you have more questions, if you have, you know, you want to take this a step further, then you can absolutely do that. And my goal is to get you outside of that comfort zone, get you networking with people that can help you along the way. And who knows, it might be something that could be profitable for you in the future. Maybe you learn a new technique or a new way to do something today that you can directly apply to, you know, your business in the future. And as always, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to me at social at the Pixel Connection, and I will be able to answer any of those questions for you. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Kevin, but before I do, I wanted to say hi to a few people here. Hello, Chris Gilbert, just showing up for the countdown music, so he's probably already gone. Uh, Jim Summers, keeping the streak alive here in Wadsworth. Brad Cohn says, hello, Kevin Best. Apparently, I'm not even here. Karna, can't hear you. Yeah, that was when I was muted. That's that's my bad. No sound. Take it off your mask. We'll go through all those. And Jen Stitt is here, hoping to learn a little bit more about video. Thanks for being here, Jen. I appreciate it. So, Kevin, it's all yours, my friend. We'll awesome. bring your uh, presentation up here on screen, and I'll let you take it from here. Cool. So, uh, as TJ mentioned, one of my goals is to get people a little bit more acclimated with video. I know everyone has a camera, even if you're a photographer, it has video functionality. So you might as well use the other half of your camera and get familiar with it. So we'll just jump right in. So first things first, um, I just wanna go over the basics. Even if you know this, it's sometimes good to go over. Um, I shoot in 24 frames per second. Um, this is gonna be uh, your most cinematic motion. Um, we've been shooting in 24 frames per second since the beginning of film. Um, and I'm not saying you should only shoot in 24 frames per second, but this is a good starting point. Um, I know people who shoot sports, they want to shoot 60 frames per second. And even I shoot 60 frames per second. And I translate that to 24 frames per second in post so I can get really nice slow motion. Um, but to get started, I completely recommend shooting 24 frames per second. Um, and I know some of you might be wondering, why not shoot 30 frames per second? Uh, 30 frames per second is basically... a, a useless at this point. Um, it was used for broadcast for a while and even they have switched over to shooting 60 frames per second for sports and 24 frames per second uh, for television shows. So you'll notice in TV how everything's become very cinematic and it's because they've, they've switched over to shooting in that 24 frames per second. Um, the next thing to go over is shutter speed. So if you're a photographer, you're very familiar with shutter speed um, and, and the, the way to shoot um, to get the best motion is to double your frame rate. So if you're shooting 24 frames per second, you want a one over 48 uh, shutter speed. Um, same thing if you're shooting 60, you're always just doubling it uh, to get the most accurate motion out of it. Um, if your camera has shutter angle, which I don't have down here, I highly, highly recommend using shutter angle, which is, um, it's gonna emulate the rotary shutter that film cameras had back in the day, and it's gonna get the 100% most accurate motion uh, out of your camera if you're shooting 24, 60, any, you don't have to worry about doing the math and switching over uh, to shutter speed. So moving on to ISO, again, if you're a photographer, you're very familiar with this, um, but every camera has a native ISO. So when you're shooting video, you wanna be shooting on that native ISO. Um, if you start veering away from it, so if you're shooting 1600, 3200, you're gonna start getting a lot more noise, a lot more grain. And if you go below the native, so something like 400, 200, 100, you're not gonna get more grain. You're actually gonna get a lot less grain, but you're gonna lose a lot of dynamic range. So you wanna find that perfect median, which is you know, whatever the native is. And uh, if you have a camera and you don't know what the native ISO is, you can always just go do a quick little Google search and I'm sure it'll come up. Um, and I'm not saying you have to stay there, but try not to veer so far from either one. Um, and then just overall, just going manual 
uh, try and stay away from using things like auto ISO, uh, auto focus. Um, you'll notice that once you start to get acclimated and, and into the filmmaking, um, you want full control over the picture that you're you're getting. And I know autofocus and everything has gotten a lot better, uh, but you don't want the camera deciding what should be in focus um, all the time because it might not fully understand your vision. So moving Absolutely. on. And I want to jump in here too and on this first slide. So just a couple of the takeaways that Kevin has here. Number one, you know, 24 frames per second is, you know, a good starting point if you're doing just like kind of that regular... Um, you know, you're just looking for a more cinematic look for your videos. Um, you should double your shutter speed if your camera doesn't have shutter angle. And shutter angle is something that's available on the Panasonic cameras, um, the GH5, the GH5S, the S series. Um, that, that shutter angle makes your life really easy because it locks it in and then you never have to worry about it again. And the issue is, you know, this is 24 frames per second. So if you double it, you need it at, you know, 48th. So you know, how do you lock that in? So you have to go to, you know, 50th of a second, whereas having shutter angle keeps you locked in there all the time. So that's one of the advantages of the Panasonic cameras and other cam, like higher end cinema cameras, they all do the right. shutter angle thing. And then the other thing is native ISO. So native ISO is for stills and video is where your camera is going to give you the most dynamic range. So a lot of people, you know, as especially as photographers, we want to go lower because that's what we've been trained. We don't want a lot of noise when in reality, we're kind of reducing our, the amount of, um, you know, we don't want grain. So we, we put that down to a hundred or 125. Well, in reality, we're losing the dynamic range that's in there. So it's really hard to find a native ISO for a camera. Um, but if you can do your research, do some digging around, um, it would be worthwhile for you to do so. Um, bonus points for all you geeky people out there. Look up the term ISO invariance and see what that tells you about ISO as well. A little extra little um, scavenger hunt for you. So I just wanted to go over a couple of those tips because I think those are, you know, we're coming off within five, you know, 10 minutes of starting and we have just already a ton of knowledge, a lot of notes being that you should be writing down. So just wanted to go through a couple of those with you. Cool. All right. I will move on to the next slide. Also, I can't see any comments. So if there are comments being thrown this way for questions, uh, TJ, just let me know. Um, so moving on uh, to exposing video properly. Um, so never change your shutter speed for exposure. And I know this might seem strange for people coming from a photography background, but um, as I mentioned, as TJ mentioned, the second you start moving your shutter speed, it's gonna start changing uh, the motion of your video. So if I'm shooting 20, 24 frames per second and it's really bright outside and I crank it to something like 120 or a thousand shutter speed, I'm gonna start getting a really, really wonky motion for my video. Uh, use your ISO. I know we, we discussed that if you veer from it, um, you're gonna get more noise or if you veer lower, but it's better to move your ISO and then maybe use a denoiser in post than to uh, mess with your shutter speed. Um, you also have your aperture. So on your lenses, you can always crank down on your aperture and shoot something like an F16 if it's super bright or if it's really dark, you know, and you have a fast lens that you can open up to a 2, 2, 8, 1, 7 uh, to get, give yourself more light. Um, I use ND filters all the time, uh, so I don't have to touch any of that. Um, I can just throw a filter on and worry about the stops that are on the ND filters and go from there. So there's many different ND filters that you can get. You can get single stop, you can get variable. Um, if I'm shooting a short film and I have time to switch between ND filters, I will use single stop. Uh, but if I'm shooting a documentary and I'm doing a lot of run and gun shooting, I will typically use variable so I don't have to worry about swapping out different ND filters. Um, I can just, you know, move it on the lens and I'm good to go. So moving on. So, uh, as most of you probably know, um, the resolution uh, has become incredibly important in cameras. Uh, and even mine's kind of behind on the times now is because we have 6K, we have 8K, uh, but most people are going to be shooting in 4K. So, as you can tell, just how large 4K is compared to 1080. I mean, it is four times the size of normal full HD. Um, and some Panasonic cameras have D 
DCI 4K, which is your cinema 4K, which is going to be your true 4K, which is 4096 by 2160, whereas UHD is 3840 by 2160. Now, there's not much of a difference there, but if you plan on doing any cropping in post, um, then this this can be very important. You can have a little bit more resolution to work with, and you can jump in and crop a little bit more if you wanted to. So, moving on. Okay, rules of third in film. Again, if you're coming from a photography background, um, you're kind of familiar with this guideline, uh, but this is just a great way to compose an image. Um, I use it quite often, and you'll notice that when you're watching a professional Hollywood film, they use it quite often as well. For example, I pulled up some stills from War Horse, directed by Steven Spielberg and shot by longtime collaborator John Us Kaminsky. Um, they use the rule of thirds for almost every single shot in this movie. And it, it's just a great way for the audience eye to go to the subject. Uh, you can kind of, you know, compose a shot and, and, you know, take the eye where you want it to go. So for something like this shot, this shot as well, they're using the rule of thirds. This shot. And then, do we have any questions? TJ, has there been any questions? Not yet. Nope, I will jump in when there are. A couple people say hello. So Les and Chris Zyman say hello to, oh, hello to them. Also say hello. Absolutely. Awesome. I'll continue then. Okay, cool. so two displays that I use quite often for both production and post-production are waveform and vectorscope. And I know I saw um, it being used and talked about in a previous presentation, but I really do want to hit home on how important waveform monitors are. I use them all the time. Um, and basically it's going to give you a little bit more than a histogram would give you. It's not just going to show you, um, where things or how things are being exposed, but where things are being ex exposed. Um, and the waveform works in the same thing as an IRE scale, which is just a, a measurement for video showing you that the zeros are your blackest blacks and 100 is your whitest whites. Anything above 100 is clipping. Anything below zero, you've gone too far. So when exposing an image, I like to consistently use a waveform monitor, uh, especially when I'm shooting in something like log. It's good to have a waveform up so you can see that you're properly exposing uh, video when shooting in such a neutral grayed out uh, display. So the vector scope is, oh, go ahead, DJ. I was gonna say, so I wanna jump on this waveform because we're, this is probably one of the most important things for Panasonic cameras and that I, one of the reasons that I love Panasonic cameras is this, this is like a live readout for you. So this is probably like, if you were to visualize this, there's probably like, oh, you could have like a window on the right side because there's a ton of light there right. and then it trails off. That means there's a ton of shadow, um, mm -hmm. you know, where it comes down and then there's a little bit more light, but this is like a lot. It's not, a, you don't read this like a Instagram where, you know, you have your highlights and your shadows. This is live showing you the brightest part. So think about if you were taking a picture of, say a uh, bride in front of a window that you'd expect everything around the bride to be up near a hundred because it's probably blown out from the window. But then you visually see like the little body there. Like you mm -hmm. see like where there's no detail because there's not, you know, that doesn't, there's no light hitting there. So this is one thing I wish we could apply to still photography because this would be such a useful tool for exposure because I know if I'm hitting at the top of that 100, I'm not going to have information there. Just like if I'm not, if I fall below the zero or depending on how, you know, every camera, the scopes are a little bit different, but it might fall below that. So I know there's no information in those shadows. So again, there, these are scientific tools that these cinematographers have that I wish us photographers had because it would make our lives so much easier. And that's the same thing that Kevin's about to talk for the vector scope, but waveform is based on exposure. What is the vector scope used for, Kevin? So the vector scope can be used for many different things. It can be used to get correct skin tones. It can be used for white balance. It can be used for color saturation. And I use it for all three of those tools. So three things. So the, the white balance, you're going to want this white mess to be in the middle. That'll let you know that, that your blacks are black and your whites are white. Um, it can also be used for color accuracy as well. So let's say I'm shooting a Coca-Cola commercial. I have to make sure 
that the Coke Red is Coke Red and not some variant has like pinks in there or anything like that. So what I can do is I can take an image of a Coke bottle and I can see what it looks like where the information lies on the vector scope. And then when I go out to shoot, I can match that. So when um, I show that to a client, they can see the color, color accuracy of their product. So I'm not, you know, veering off on uh, kind of misrepresenting that product. Um, it can also be used for getting amazing skin tones, specifically in post-production. So when I do a lot of coloring, I will always have a vector scope up to make sure that I'm getting proper skin tones. And this vector scope doesn't have it, but usually there's a line that jolts out right about here. And I mean, this can be for anyone's skin tone. You want it to match around here. So if I'm going and I'm making some sort of crazy look, I can still check to make sure that my skin tones are lying on that line and then I haven't gone and totally warped their skin tones at all. Um, and the same thing goes for white balance, you know, just to make sure everything's lying still in the middle. Um, so yeah, it's great for production. It's great for post-production. Um, these little tiny squares here are where you want your saturation to, these are kind of like a gate almost. Anything that goes past that, you've, you're getting some crazy color compression. You've, you've taken the image way too far so you want to kind of bring down the saturation so if i'm shooting at a sky and i've cranked my blue or something like that it might go way past the blue marker and i know i have to bring down my saturation because i've taken it too far and if i go and if i upload this on youtube or something like that i know it's just going to look like a hot mess it's going to be super compressed uh, and it's just not going to look great at all i hope that's a good explanation of vector scope. It is, and also what's nice about these tools is, you know, you see them on cameras like the Panasonic, like the GH5, you know, has these built in. But what's great is once you go into editing, you're gonna see these same tools in DaVinci. You're gonna see them in Premiere. You're gonna see similar scopes, so that way you can kind of align, you know, if you need to push it a little bit more or pull it down, you're gonna see these scopes. So if you want to learn a little bit more about these, you know, look up waveform, look up vector scope, because these are kind of the tools that you're gonna have in your tool belt. Just like as photographers, we have different tools that we use. These are the in-camera tools that you're gonna be able to use to make sure your exposure is spot on and your vector scope is going to help you with your color and make sure it's spot on for sure okay moving on if, as long as there's no questions nope no questions so far sweet okay so shooting with fast lenses and cinema lenses um, one of the quickest ways to get a super cinematic look is to shoot with fast lenses. Now I'm not saying you should shoot wide open on fast lenses all the time, but if you're just getting started, one way to create a super professional look is to shoot with a lot of shallow depth of field and you're able to get that by shooting with faster lenses. Um, and the difference between photography lenses and cinema lenses is there's really like two big differences and that's the focus. Uh, it's going to pull all the way around. Um, and cinema lenses are typically going to have a declicked aperture ring on the lens. And I like to shoot usually with prime lenses. Again, it completely changes depending on the scenario. So if I'm shooting a documentary, shooting with a bunch of, you know, these, these single focal length lenses uh, will hold me back. And I might want to shoot with something that's a zoom lens, but still has, um, you know, a wide open aperture that I can work with. So it really depends on the situation. If you're filming something, you have time to switch over, like a music video, short film, or even a commercial, you might have time to use, um, you know, prime lenses. And I might I jumped away to try to just grab a cinema lens, and I'll I'll bring one back, um, cool. just to kind of talk about it because. And if you already said this, I apologize. But the rings on them is they're kind of a standard too. It has like the teeth on them, right? And that's Correct. for like going on rigs. Correct. Yeah. So if you wanted to attach a focus system um, for wireless wired, uh, yeah, the the grids that exist in them allow you to connect on it and someone can wirelessly pull focus or you can pull focus, but you really don't want any hands on the lens when filming because you can create vibration or anything like that. So, And that's why when you see these lenses, and this is a kind of... Uh this is how you know it's a cinema lens is if you look at this photo, you'll see that they have like these little teeth on them. And that's what he's talking about where it'll grip into the little teeth for your focus pulling. And what he means by declicked aperture or declicked um, focus rings is that, 
you know, you can move it all the way around and it's going to be able to pull your focus. And then also these are done in T stops, right, Kevin? Correct. And what exactly, what's Close the difference between like a T stop and an F stop? I really don't know. I'll be honest. That's like the one thing <laughs> okay. I don't know. Um, a T stop is like the actual measurement of light that's coming through. So like this will be a T a T 2.0 is different than an F 2.0. Um, so you have to, when you're looking at these different lenses, you have to, um, you'll have to do a little bit of research for, you know, the one is amount of measured light. And then the other one is the amount of light that's like allowed in. So it's just a different way to measure um, the light that's coming through the lens, but you'll see that these have a T on them instead of an F. Um, also what he was saying about, you know, focus pulling is these lenses, chances are they're not autofocus. Actually, I don't know that there's really any cinema lenses that are autofocus. Um, so these are going to be manual focus lenses. So that's why you need that extra focus puller that goes on the side that allows you to pull what, you know, kind of what you want in focus. Correct. Cool. No cool. questions. Yet. Awesome. So gear for movement. Uh, obviously we have our tripod and there's gonna be a difference between photo tripods and video tripods and the head's going to be so much bigger to hold larger rigs. And even this, example of a tripod is relatively small compared to the industry standard tripods. If you did a Google search, I mean, just looked up a professional Hollywood tripod setup, they're usually these giant O'Connor tripods to hold like 60 pounds of, you know, huge camera weight and all, all the accoutrement that's thrown on there. Um, obviously one that's become unbelievably huge is drones. Everyone asks about drones and I mean, they are completely awesome. Um, shooting a lot of commercials. It's one of like the first things that clients ask is like, do you have a drone? Can we get drone shots? Everyone has drone shots. And the other heavyweight that's become uh, constantly used, uh, even all the way up to professional shoots are these gimbal stabilizers. I know Ronin has one, um, Zion Crane has one, and there's many other companies that make them. Um, we have the slider that's even I still use, they're great for like interview setups. And sometimes you get some that are motorized. So you can just like, you know, calculate where you want them to move and how fast and just let them do their thing. Um, but they've kind of even been taken over by the gimbals just because you can get these really nice dolly movements out of the gimbal. You can do nice pans. Um, what I will say is I, I, you shouldn't use them all the time because it, I think a lot of people who get them get kind of stuck because of how easy they are to use and you've created the rig and everything. Uh, but they should only be used for very specific moments. Like if you're tracking a subject or you need to emulate a dolly movement, um, then I would say to use them. But uh, yeah, I think people get a, a stuck using one specific piece of gear. Absolutely. And I, I almost think it's like a recipe. Like if you put too much salt in, like it's going to ruin the recipe. Correct. And I'm guilty of that. Like the one wedding film that I did, it was like all slider. Like, I, I mean, I slid it in, like they were up at the altar. So I did a slide in shot when they walked out. I did, everything was like just sliding this back and forth movement. I'm like, right. I'm using this a little too much. I uh, need to just like salt, like a little bit of salt, a little, you know, give, you know, you want movement in the film to keep it interesting, but not the same thing over and over again. Right. Yeah. One thing they taught us in film school is that movement should have purpose. Uh, even, you know, when you're focusing on something, if you want to go out of focus, into focus something, are, are you revealing something or are you just trying to do a cool movement or, or you know, focus? It, sometimes it's not great to be flashy. Sometimes it is great to be flashy, but always try and find purpose in the movement that you're trying to create. Yeah. That's a, a huge tip that I have to give to you guys. Um, like if you're going to do a pan shot, you have a tripod, do it on the tripod. It's, you're not going to get the same um, smooth pan as you would out of a gimbal. It's just not going to happen. Love it. Cool. Moving on. So planning ahead. So now we have all the recipes, you know, all the ingredients. We're, we're ready to go but we need to plan ahead. So for pre-production, so the first thing I do when I'm brought onto a pro project, um, if brought on early enough, sometimes they have a, another person to do this, uh, is location scouting. So for shooting a short film, music video, I like to go around um, and try and find these really awesome locations to shoot in. Um, one thing I've learned from shooting a ton of different films and music videos and commercials is that 
a location can save your life. It just makes your job so much easier. So, you know, if I'm going to Montana to shoot some mountains, it's pretty much impossible to make a mountain look bad unless you really try hard enough. Uh, but there are sometimes scenarios where you're stuck shooting in a really awful location and you have to put so much effort to make it look really nice. So finding a really great location is going to save you a ton of time. It's just going to ramp up your production completely and, and just create a really nice professional look if you're able to find a really good location. Um, I know there are some places online where people upload, you know, like this was a really cool location I was at. Like Reddit has some really great ones. I think you can even just search like great photography, great video locations in my area um, or just talk to people and, and see, see if they've been to really cool places. Uh, if you're part of a photo community or a video community, more than likely they have a really nice location. Uh, some people are willing to give out where they are. Some people aren't, but uh, it's always good to look out for them. Uh, moving on to uh, the look. So when I'm filming, specifically, this isn't so much for commercials, but for, um, you know, music videos, short films, even documentaries sometimes, I like to decide on the look before shooting. So I'll talk with the director, I'll talk with the writer, uh, and we'll kind of come up with, with a look before shooting, and uh, we can create LUTs to put on display. Um, this kind of will help with even the previous location scouting to find the right look. Uh, it's all about working with, uh, you know, the director and whoever on, on figuring out exactly what you want it to look like. So you're not scrambling to figure it out during production or in post. Um, and one way to do that is through storyboards. So I, I can't draw at all, but even creating little stick figures to kind of give everyone a visual representation of what I'm doing is a lot better than having nothing. Um, if they don't even want a storyboard, I will definitely create a shot list. So just, you know, if I'm shooting a, a scene in a diner, I might want to do, you know, over the shoulder shot, 50 millimeter lens, um, and just have this all written out. So I'm ready to go on production and I'm not wasting anybody's time. Um, finding inspiration goes, uh, hand in hand with deciding on the look before shooting. Um, and one place I go to all the time is Film Grab. It's this website where this person has kind of created a bunch of stills from basically every single film ever made. Uh, and it really gives me a, a good look at a color palette of tone um, and just a, a theme throughout that I can kind of pull from. And then I can show the director, hey, what about this look? What do we think about this? And I can visually show him this film and like specific film grabs from it. Uh, even just watching movies can also help and you can send them over a scene. But I have some examples. So this is taken straight from film grab uh, from the movie Blade Runner, uh, which is a film that I'm heavily inspired by. And I can show them these stills and, and show them the blues and this kind of neo-noir look and see if a director or client uh, likes this look. And I can show them the color palette as well and the saturation and you know discuss with them on whether or not they want this look or not so film grab all you do is just search it on google or filmgrab.com i'm pretty sure is what it is um and you can look up literally any movie ever and they will have a ton of these film grabs you can click on them individually i will even use these for post-production as well so if i'm color grading any project um, i like to bring in some sort of um you know, visual representation of what I'm trying to create. So I can I can even use like their waveform or or the vector scope with this image to kind of, you know, emulate the look of any film uh, that I want. Yes, and I did just put that um, link. It's film-grab.com. Awesome. Um, I think filmgrab.com is like a like a land page, like a landing page to try to rip you off. So don't go to that one. Use yes. the one that I put in the chat. The dash is. <laughs> So unbelievably important. <laughs> cool. So yeah, these are just kind of the, a few things that I like to use when um, I'm brought on to the pre-production side um, of a project for cinematography. So production. So lighting. Lighting is probably the most important aspect of cinematography. Um, if you don't understand lighting, uh, being a cinematographer is going to be a very difficult job unless you have like a really awesome gaffer who knows everything 
and can kind of take over that side of, of cinematography for you. So this was a shot from a music video that I worked on about two years ago, I want to say, maybe even longer. Uh, but it has some really nice lighting in it that I want to go over. So we have this shot as well. So what I like to do is I can create a, you know, a, a little grid and just show exactly what I want to create before I get on set at all. So I knew going in, we were going to have stage lights. The artist had this H2O light, which kind of just created these like weird wavy effects that was able to um, kind of separate the uh, artist from the background. Uh, having the stage lights already there was a super plus because they're so bright and I can add fog or mist and, and really add some direction to those lights. Uh, and then we just had some quasars in front of the artist uh, with a ton of diff. I didn't want it too sharp. I wanted to keep everything nice and soft. What I didn't is want what? Oh, so diff is diffusion. So you can just put this this like white sheet, not too thick, not too thin, uh, in front of a light, and it'll just completely soften the light. Um, it's used almost all the time. I can't remember a shoot where I'm not using diffusion. It's just if if you were to put a harsh light into someone's face, it never looks great at all and it really shows a lot of the blemishes and if you add like a really nice soft light with diffusion on someone it, it just makes them look a lot better so i think i have another example from a music video that i did very recently i think like three months ago and this was this look was created with only a single light so we had a light from above with a 1K tungsten with the fusion under it. And then we just had a white bounce board underneath the subject just to kind of bounce light back up. And then we didn't really want to add any more lights because we wanted to create this complete black void. So we just really wanted to light the subject and let everything else go dark. So we're able to create this really nice um, isolated void look. And so if you if you have one light and you can go to somewhere like Walmart or anything and just get like a piece of art board that can bounce light, you're kind of good to go. And this was shot on the S1H with a 85 millimeter, these really awesome vintage uh, Pentax Super Tacomar lenses that we had cine modded. So we had them de-clicked and we had these grids put on so we can pull focus. And they're really awesome. They do create this really cool vintage look. So you don't need a lot of lights uh, to create a really awesome look. Um, the biggest tip, and you'll notice this now for like any movie you ever see, is that commercials, music videos, anything is usually shot on shadow side. I would say like 99.9% .9 of the time you'll notice that the camera is on the shadow side. And what this is going to do is it's going to create this really nice dynamic look in the face. If you were shooting the other side, it kind of takes it away and creates this like one dimensional look where this is just going to have like it, it just immediately gives it a more cinematic look and so this is taken from blade runner 2049 i don't know why i keep having blade runner references but this is what we're going to work with for now <laughs> so i mean you can notice st straight away that they're using basically the same principles i am with just bigger and more expensive lights but they have you know like something that's like an h2o light in the back just to separate the subject from the background they, they have a top light, you can tell, from the, the nice soft light that's hitting the top here. And then just a light coming from here as the key. And they're just having negative fill here to just add a little bit of shadow to the camera side. And this is just the, the over shoulder, over the shoulder of the, of the same scene. Even she has the shoulder or the, the shadow on her side as well. Just enough light to create separation from the background. And the same thing as well with a top light. So. Basically, all you need is three lights, um, and you can create pretty much any cinematic look you want. Any questions about that? Nothing so far. Sweet. I will continue on. So post-production, which is editing, color grading, sound, and rendering. Um, this can become you know, the most time-consuming and complex side of filmmaking. Uh, but I will hopefully give you some tools and tips to kind of 
get you started at least. So some editing software that we have available, uh, Premiere Pro, Final Cut, DaVinci, uh, and Avid. Uh, so I use Premiere Pro. I'm sure everyone has Creative Cloud by this point. If you don't, it's amazing. I mean, you can get a ton of Adobe products in one subscription-based platform, and you know you just have everything to work with. You can use Final Cut. I know some people use Final Cut. When I was in school, we used Final Cut. Uh, I didn't like it at all. And this was before Final Cut Pro X came out, and then everyone hated it. But there are people who just feel more acclimated and feel more at home using different software. So it's it's totally up to you. You know, figure out which one works best for you. Uh, but I use Premiere Pro. Uh, DaVinci Resolve, they're getting a lot better at the editing side of things and not just the coloring side of things. And it does make things easier if you wanted to color within the same platform as your editing base. So they're getting better and it's also free if you didn't want the studio version. So if you have literally no software and you don't feel like paying for something, DaVinci Resolve is definitely a, a go-to. I, I couldn't recommend it enough. Avid, I I wouldn't use at all, but I have to put it on there because it's 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 part of this echelon of of you know different editing software. It's it's what the pros use. I, I've tried it. it. It's basically like the Linux of editing software. It makes absolutely no sense to most people, but for some, it, it's it makes complete sense. Um, any questions or comments about the editing software, TJ? No, and that's what I, I'll be honest. Like I tried to use DaVinci Resolve, and Kevin's tried to teach me Resolve, and I, my brain just doesn't work like that. But Premiere and Final Cut, I seem to get along fine with. Um, and again, Avid, like you said, you know, you keep seeing Avid in there, but I never, I guess I've I've never used it. I know that it's definitely used out there somewhere. Um, yes. But honestly, if you can learn one or two, I would say Premiere and Final Cut, or again, DaVinci's nice because you don't have to pay for it. So. Right. Yes, it's a great yeah. option. Well, yeah, if you want to spend zero dollars, if you've never done video and you like, I don't even know if I want to spend the money on an editing software for video because I'm just getting started. DaVinci Resolve is a, a, a decent place to begin, um, and there are ways for you to change the uh, windows to make it look more like Premiere Pro now, which is great. So when if you first download DaVinci Resolve, it'll ask you like, uh, which editing software are you most familiar with, and you can click Premiere Pro, and then it'll kind of configure things to make sense for people who are coming from Premiere Pro. So there is that option. So color grading, there are many, many different options. Um, the one I use is DaVinci Resolve. It is absolutely the industry standard. There's nothing that even comes close to the amount um, of tools that you have available at your hand in DaVinci Resolve. Um, it's amazing, it's, it's the greatest of all time but there are Premiere Pro that they have Lumetri, which is, it's very good. It's a bit limiting, but in terms of a great second place, Premiere Pro is awesome, especially with the addition of Lumetri and the additions of being able to add LUTs and everything onto the editing software. Um, it, it is pretty nice. And I, I've, there's been times where I've, I have to get a project done as quick as possible. And Lumetri is my go-to because I just don't have time to spend working on different nodes in DaVinci Resolve and, and really uh, giving it some tender love and care in DaVinci. So Lumetri is great. After Effects also has their own color grading within there. Again, pretty limiting. Um, Final Cut Pro as well. Uh, Magic Bullet Looks is something that I've used. It, it's a plugin that you can get on both Final Cut, Premiere, um, and I think even Avid can get Magic Bullet Looks. Um, it's just kind of like this plugin that gives you a little bit more options that you wouldn't be able to get from just your traditional um, color grading tab on an editing software. And then Avid, of course, has their own color grading, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't use it. So I'm a DaVinci Resolve guy. Uh, there is a workflow that goes within that, especially if you're editing in Premiere. Uh, but there's a million YouTube tutorials and how to work from Premiere Pro to DaVinci and then back to Premiere Pro. Um, or you can just straight up edit all the way through and color in DaVinci Resolve. Um, so yeah, I can even, you know what? While I'm here on this page, I have, I hope this works, TJ. I'm gonna pull up DaVinci Resolve and hopefully it will still be shown on my screen. Whoa, yeah. Sweet, cool. So this is DaVinci Resolve. Welcome everybody. Um, 
this is this is where I spend most of my time during quarantine is just color grading constantly in DaVinci Resolve. So as you can tell, this looks super, super, super complex and I can promise you it's not. Basically they work in nodes, which is just like individual little things that you can just add little effects to. You can add everything to one node, but you wanna keep things separate. So I have one for noise reduction, exposure, saturation, white balance, a white balance adjust if things are really wild. I have these two to separate, uh, you know, things that I want to pop. I can create my look, look adjustment, vignettes, all this. So I can just keep everything really nice and separate so I can remember where the effects were. Um, so are these like horizontal layers? Like you're taking this, the, the video is going through these and getting like a car wash almost where they're getting these things applied to them? For sure, exactly. Yeah. So to this is what the image looked like in the beginning is this this super grayed out image this is log but this is also going to give you the most dynamic range to work with so i can go in and i can create a look like this it's going to be very very difficult to create a look like this without shooting in log um so i can go through and i can it's just amazing to me that that first image where it looks so blown i mean like that yeah. and then boom it becomes this total, like perfectly color graded, and yeah, you can create. Uh, th the best thing about log is that it's like this giant chunk of marble that allows you to just create anything you want out of it. It's it, it's like a blank piece of canvas. Um, you just have to make sure that you're properly exposing. Um, which, as we saw before, I can pull up my scopes. So w we saw before the waveform. So I'll, I'll turn it to black and white so you can see um, kind of what it looked like before. So, I mean, this image is, th is this. So you can see that our subject is dipping down in the shadows. Um, I wonder if it shows, so here, this is, this is a, what log looks like in a waveform. Everything is just pushed to the midtones, which is great because that means I, I can have all this room, my highlights to work and all this room in the shadows. So nothing is being underexposed or overexposed. And this is how I'm able to create, you know, an image like this. I can really, I can really push it and not have to worry so much about anything clipping. Um, same thing goes with our vector scope. So we can pull this guy up and this guy up. Cool. So as you can tell, I, I have this very Hollywood, you know, teal orange look, but my blacks are still black and my, my whitest points are still white. And that's why I still have a center point that's hitting the white balance. Also this line right here, this is, this is our skin tone line. Obviously there really is no skin tones being shown here. So I don't really have to worry about it. But if I was showing someone's face, this line would be incredibly important to worry about. Now, as you can see, I'm also, this is a pretty saturated image, but not saturated enough where it's passing any of these, these brackets here. Yeah. And so, I'm glad you brought that up because that's a good representation of just how saturated you'd have to be. Like you said, oh, you know, have to, and, yes. I mean, it would have to be really, really saturated. Yes. I don't even know if Da Vinci will allow. Okay. There we go. So this is probably too far, but to be honest, if you had an image, that looked like this, uh, hopefully your eyes would let you know that this this is aggressively saturated. This, this is <laughs> blindingly saturated. Yes. It's it's gone too far. So we can we can crank that back down. But yeah, DaVinci Resolve is is it the easiest thing to work with? No, but that's what that's what YouTube's for. Um, and honestly, I was gonna say, just seeing you go through this and making these changes, I could see where it would be, you know, pretty useful. But now, my question while we're talking about color grading, so sure. none of this has to do with any of the editing of the film at this point. I mean, it's just Correct. the color grading. So these aren't different scenes that we're seeing on the screen. These no, notes. this is one single clip. So the way you'd want to color grade let's pretend I had an entire scene of this uh, person in, in the woods. I would find one shot, which would be my master shot. I would grade it like this, and then I'd apply this 
to every single shot. And then that's where I have these look adjustments and global adjustments. And the, this is where I would go and just do a little bit of tweaking so I can get a consistent look throughout every single shot in the project that I'm working on. Um, and this would be the, the, I guess, part two of the post-production process. So I wouldn't color grade first and then edit because I could be spending a ton of time editing a shot that doesn't even make it into the film, commercial, music video, et cetera. What they would do is the editor would create, you know, a, a pretty much close to picture lock edit and then create a clean timeline, which is they'd get rid of all the effects, any sound design that they've already put in there and just give me a clean timeline of just the images and they render out an XML timeline, which again, we're getting really advanced, but I can then take that Premiere Pro timeline, bring it into DaVinci Resolve, edit it, and then do the exact same process of creating another color graded timeline and giving it back to them. So now they have, because they're editing, they're editing on log, they're editing with this. And so then I can, I can give them, I guess what they could do is they can create like a basic Rec 709 you know, transform, and then they can edit on that so they can at least kind of see what they're working with. Um, and then I can go in and delete the Rec 709, go back to log, color graded, bring it back to them. So I'm glad I have this up so I can show you guys. Yeah, that was super, super helpful. Thank you. Awesome. So, and I want to jump on while he's jumping back to the other screen. Let me know what questions you have for Kevin. Again, this is cinematography basics, but if you have any video questions, this is the yeah. time definitely to ask them. And it doesn't have to necessarily be, you know, just about Panasonic cameras. I mean, just any questions that you have, please put them in the throw them up on the window. Sweet. Okay, so moving on from color grading, we have our sound design. Um, and there's many different things you can use. Um, I, I use Logic Pro X a lot, and this is just for creating maybe sound effects, a, a score, anything. I mean, even I can take, you know, a narration or anything, and, and Logic Pro has so many tools that I can work with to really clean up audio and really amplify it, really stretch it out um, and create the most professional sounding, um, you know, narration, music, anything in Logic Pro X. And all I have to do is just render it out and send it back over to Premiere Pro. Um, but Premiere Pros, they're getting really good with sound design. Uh, I've, I've kind of veered away, at least for smaller projects, and have just been working in Premiere Pro. Um, they have really, really great sound design tools uh, that are created by, the, I think it's called Obsolete, which exists within Premiere Pro. They have really great um, equalizers, uh, reverb, anything that you need. And I mean, you can add like, 500 different audio tracks if you need to, to really create a super complex sound. Um, DaVinci Resolve also has their own sound design. It's not great, but it's it, it exists. So you can do everything in post-production within DaVinci Resolve. Uh, Avid Pro Tools is actually really great. This is the one thing that I will use from Avid uh, for sound design. There's Waves, which is a plugin that you can throw into Final Cut or, or Premiere. And then you have Audition as well for sound design. Um, and I don't really have anything for sound equipment, so I guess I'll go over that now. Um, if you're wondering if your mic that's built into your camera is good, it's not. It, there's You can buy a $5,000 camera or you can buy a $500 camera. And more than likely, the sound on these cameras is not going to suffice for any professional um you know project you're working on but you need to get something to attach um what i've been using a lot is um the ntg2 road mic um and there's task cams that you can get um i know zoom has the h4n uh, i think they have a h6 out now with like a mixer um and panasonic also has their own attachment that you can put uh, into the hot shoe and all of the um, audio can will go right onto the SD card. So I shot a, pro a project about a year ago in uh, Minnesota for this it's wacky documentary. And that was the first time I was able to use it. And um, it's saved me a ton of time in post from having to sync 
any of the audio. It just goes right into the SD card and I have the professional sounding straight from the mic um, right into post. So it's it's saved me a lot of time. That's the uh, XLR1 adapter from Panasonic. So rendering projects. So uh, for YouTube, um, you want to use H.264. It, it's what YouTube uses. Um, and to keep your bitrate low. So if you're filming in 4K, 1080, 6K, 8K, um, you don't want to crank the bitrate too much. Um, you basically want to do the compression before YouTube can get to it. Um, so if you were to upload this huge, massive five gigabyte file that you've created out of like a two minute video, YouTube's going to just destroy it and, and compress the, you know, the heck out of it. So you want to keep it very low. So when you're in Premiere Pro or Final Cut or anything, it'll give you a bunch of different render settings. And one of them is your bit rate. So if you're shooting 4K and you want to keep it 4K uh, when you upload it, uh, a, a bit rate that you want to choose is probably somewhere around like 25 to like 40, maybe even lower, depending on how short the video is. Um, if you're doing 1080, you can even bring it down to like 15. Uh, for your bit rate. Um, and this is usually what I'll give the client to upload uh, for streaming. But the, I also usually give a master, which is the, your non-stream version. So this can be a virtually uncompressed, um, you know, full video uh, of your project. So I typically do ProRes. I match the color of whatever I shot in. So if it's 422, if it's 444, um, I will match that, so I'm not getting any other color compression. You know, I got to ask. So, what is ProRes? What is H.264? And what does 422 mean? Sure. So, H.264. These are just different codecs, uh, different compressions. Uh, ProRes is is going to be your your best codec for masters. And I mean, this is even a way for for recording as well. So, I know Panasonic, they can record in H.264 and H.265. Um, but you can get like uh, an Atomos that will allow you to record in ProRes. And, and these are just better codecs for better data and give you a uh, higher quality video. Um, but they're going to be larger files to work with as well. So if you're shooting in ProRes, I mean, this is going to take up a, a large amount of space. So you would need something like an external recorder rather than just like an SD card. Um, 422, uh, so that's that's going to be, uh, has to do with your, your color. Uh, and I'll even go over 10-bit as well between 8-bit. So 8-bit is kind of the, the standard. I mean, everyone's pretty much shooting in 8-bit, uh, but Panasonic has 10-bit. Uh, I think 8-bit is like your JPEG version of video where 10-bit is kind of like in between um, RAW and JPEG. And um, it's just going to give you a, a lot more. Uh, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Uh, uh, oh gosh, uh, color combinations for RGB. So, 8-bit has 16 million different color combinations, whereas 10-bit has over a billion. So, just jumping up from 8-bit to 10-bit, you're going to get a lot more color and a lot less color compression. So, if I'm shooting a sky, a bl blue sky in 8-bit. It sees it sees blue. It's like that's great. It looks it's blue, but ten bit sees the variance. So if like uh, the sun's on the right side, it can see the different shades of blue throughout. And when you're uploading that to YouTube, you're going to see significantly less banding, like the warping that usually happens uh, in the sky because it's not going to have so much compression happening. Uh, hope that answers that question. It does indeed. And a question did come in um, from Chris Zeinman uh, that said, what can you recommend for people starting out for a beginner, you, a beginner audio uh, setup? But you answered that perfectly. Um, another thing, the uh, Tech Gear Talk love that you called it aggressively saturated. Uh, Jen, uh, we used Final Cut and Avid in film school. So there mm -hmm. you go. Um, but yeah, so far, so good. Um, can you give us, like, we always hear codec, but like, what is it? I mean, I know we're going to get a go basic here, but what is like a codec? What is the purpose of a codec? Um, from my understanding, and this is even too deep for me because I'm not much of an editor. Mm -hmm. So maybe you have more information on what a codec is. Uh, but for me, it's just uh, a, a, a compression for recording or um, exporting. Um, I don't know if you have any more information on that. 
Yeah, so codec would be um, encode, decode. So if we were to just take, and some cameras do this, where it'll allow RAW, actually Panasonic um, just announced an update where it allows for you know RAW capture, but those are, that's gonna be huge files. Remember, we're doing 60 frames per second or sometimes even more. So that's a ton of information coming off of these full frame, I mean, 20 plus megapixel sensors. So you would be chewing up cards. So what a codec does is it'll encode or it'll compress, um, compress, decompress. Mm -hmm. So it'll compress that information into whatever codec and then your computer knows, hey, this is in this codec, this is what I need to do to basically open that up or use this information um, and then be able to edit it. So it's a way, it's a basically a packaging for that clip because we don't, a lot of times we don't even want, you know, full on raw. Now the stuff that Kevin's working on, yeah, like he wants more information for, you know, maybe the documentaries or the shorts or whatever that is that he's working on. But if you're trying to upload a YouTube video a week, you probably don't want to shoot in raw because it's going to take you a week just to manage that. I mean, you're going to have to go to Best Buy to buy another hard drive. I mean, just because of the amount of data that, that takes up. So that's where these codecs come in that's where it's important that you choose what codec you're going to use the color that you're going to use um that information so that way you know in your editor you have to make sure your editor can handle that like your editing tool um but basically it's a way to compress it just like jpeg is for raw files it's similar for your codec awesome and kind of going off of that um a lot of people have asked me in previous presentations, uh, is their computer able to handle, uh, you know, shooting in 4K? I mean, most cameras now have 4K. Um, and what I will say is, yes, any computer can handle 4K. Now, when you're editing, um, what I would do is create proxies, which you can look up. Uh, there's a, a ton of YouTube tutorials on creating proxies, which is basically just going to create this, this lower res, something that your computer can handle for editing and you can toggle it on and off. Um, so even if you shoot 4K, you can have a proxy that's in like 480 or 720. So you can have this huge project to work on. And this is kind of like the industry standard way of editing. So, I mean, even the most beefy system, you're probably not gonna edit 8K raw straight from Premiere Pro. Um, it's just not gonna be able to handle it. So what they'll do is they'll take all the clips, they'll put it through a proxy and just create a lower res version of it. And then they can edit off of that. But when they're done, they can just toggle off the proxies and boom, they still have all the AK footage that they shot within that timeline. So it's it's not so much can my computer handle it, it's just understanding the, the process that you'd have to go through to allow your computer to handle the clips that you shot. So there's there's been so many different tools that's made to to handle all the higher resolutions and higher codecs uh, that are available now. So. Very helpful, thank you. Yep, I think that, that, that's it. That's my uh, presentation. That's the last thing you need to know is, is the rendering of your projects because you're, you're done. You're done, you're you ready to get it out there. Well, I appreciate it, my friend. We're about an hour, we're actually like, boom, like an over an hour, that is awesome. So while I go over a couple more things, if you do have comments, it looks like we still have about 20 people here with us. If you do have comments, please let me know. So that way, you know, I can go through and we can get those answered before we let Kevin get back to his uh, color grading project. So um, if you do have any questions, please put them in the chat below. I wanted to let you know something that Kevin will be joining us at, and that is Pixel Photo Fest. That is coming up August 14th through 16th. And it's probably the most, it is the most hands-on conference um, for photography, for videography, for cinematography in the area. And we have talent from all over the US, top talent coming in to talk about photo and video. And because you guys are on the live stream, you can actually save a hundred bucks by using code lunch and learn. And that actually gives you half off the conference. And what's great about this conference is, you know, you can sit down with Kevin and be like, hey, you, I know that I watched that live stream back during, you know, the Corona thing and you talked about this and how do I do that? And he can get hands on with you and show you how to do that. That's the type of conference this is. It's based on community. It's based on, you know, helping each other out and just building a stronger um, photo and film community in this area. So definitely use um, that discount code to save you some money.
Also, this week's contest, uh, we do this every single week. Uh, this week's theme is landscape. Um, so if you can just share with us on Instagram at the Pixel Connection or on Facebook, if you you know post on this, um, I posted the same graphic up on Facebook, so you can just put it in the comments there, uh, but you can win 50 bucks. And this week's theme is landscape. Also, I want to let you know that we're working with Sigma to raise money for local food banks. So 5% of your Sigma lens purchase will go directly to the Cleveland Food Bank. So if you've been thinking about that new art lens or maybe that contemporary, that 150 to 600 to get those eagle photos, um, that's, that's really just me talking. I'm, I'm looking at that lens right now. Now is the time to do it because it's going to help those families in need. If you are in need of extra help with your camera, we are also offering one-on-one -on -one classes. So you know, here we have, you know, picture with Caitlin, but all team members are available to help you out depending on what your needs are. What else is going on this week? So obviously today we had a great presentation about cinematography and video. Thank you, Kevin, for joining us today. Yes. Tomorrow we have Tether Tools in which they, they're going to talk about, you know, why Tether. On Thursday, we're going to talk to Aaron Anderson. If you haven't seen his work, holy crap, he does cinematic portraiture. And some of the projects that he's done, if you just do a Google search for his name, his stuff is just awe-inspiring. He did this thing with um, an astronaut. It, it was just absolutely amazing. And even the graphic that I posted for um, his live stream on Facebook, you'll see where he did this thing with the balloons. It's just, he does some amazing work. I definitely think you should definitely stop by and watch that with us. I'm excited. I'm super excited for it. And he's also going to be at PhotoFest. So you'll get to learn from him directly as well. On Friday, we're going to have our um, Friday focus. And then on Monday, we're going to be talking about Hollywood portraiture with Bobby Lane. So that's going to be an awesome, awesome one as well. Um, just talking about more hard lighting, using things like a Kukaloris, um, that's what that's going to be talking about. So um, if there is no, if there are no questions, uh, we're going to go ahead and end it here. We are open at the store, so please feel free to give us a call. Uh, join us on Facebook, Instagram, wherever it is you are. Uh, we are here to help you. Thank you again, Kevin, for joining us. Absolutely. I appreciate it, and we hope everybody has an awesome week. We'll see you.